The Tolkien Road, Episode 132, The Lord of the Rings, The Steward and the King. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 5, The Steward and the King. Before we get started, please head on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. You can also stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. Follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road and on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. John here. Greta, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. Terrific. Episode 132, Book 6, Chapter 5 of The Lord of the Rings, The Steward and the King. Yep. Uh, Special thanks to our executive producers, Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as our other generous patrons. If you'd like to contribute to the Tolkien Road... Visit us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road, or you can just go to TolkienRoad.com and find out more. Um, so we've been away for a little while. Yeah, I feel a little rusty. We, we had meant to be kind of keeping at the weekly pace, and um, December just turned out to be an extremely busy month, even more busy than just Christmas going on, but like, yeah. um, just turned out to be a really busy month. Yeah. By the way... Merry Christmas. Still yes, Christmas. Yes, still Christmas. Um, Keep those lights up, people. Here in, here in this little corner of Tolkien, Tolkiendom, um, absolutely still Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christmas for Catholics is uh, an eight-day affair in terms of the octave of Christmas. Mm-hmm. So we partied up for eight full days. Heck yes, we do. And um, and then, you know, you got the 12 days all the way through to um, Epiphany. Epiphany. And... Yeah, you know, so that's where the twelve days of Christmas comes from. That mm-hmm. whole idea, um, and yeah, I don't know. You can even make the argument it goes even longer. You could go all the way to the baptism of Jesus, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe go all the way to the presentation. Heck, I maybe, like to go all the way to Fat Tuesday personally. I mean, you know, why not? Why not? Exactly. Why not? Let's party. Party it up so that you get it all out of your system and can have a good Lent. That's right. That's right. So Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry Christmas. Merry everyone. Merry Christmas. Um, so, book six, chapter five, um, a lot going on in this one, a lot going on yeah, in this chapter. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I it liked is, it. It is really good. Lots, lots to talk about. Uh, I'm not sure we can, you know, this is one of those where I'm just like, man, we cannot possibly cover everything that's, that's going on in this chapter in sufficient detail. We're going to try to hit all the high points, but... You know, there's there's so much good stuff. I mean, you could you could spend a couple episodes probably just on, at least one full episode on Eowyn and Faramir alone in this chapter. Oh yeah, um, it's just a really interesting topic. And um, I have to say, you got me that you got me this right, or was that my parents? No, that was your parents. Okay, well, you got so I mean, this is a very Tolkien Christmas for me. You got me, <laughs> you got me a cool T-shirt I did. that has all of the, you know, all of the uh, uh, Valar. Mm-hmm. On it, yeah. right? All their all the Valar names all on it. The Valar, that's super cool. Yep, and and then you got me the the Tolkien the Illustrator book, right? Um, no, was that was that not you? Was that my no, parents? No, I only again? got you the T-shirt. The T-shirt? Yeah. Okay. I think so your I, parents really got you everything on your wish list. That got me the Tolkien, Tolkien stuff. Okay, mm-hmm. fair enough, fair enough. But anyway, I was going to say one of those books. So one of those books was. The Lord of the Rings, A Reader's Companion, um, by Wayne Hammond and Christina Skoll, who are uh, Tolkien scholars extraordinaire. And uh, that they've also done a lot of the books on his illustrations. So, you know, they're look them up on Amazon, go buy some of their go buy some of their stuff. Worth definitely worth your time. Yeah. But this book is really cool. It's a you know, basically goes through all of Lord of the Rings and it's just like a commentary, but it uses it it gathers some scholarly sources, but it also gathers it gives a lot of background information mm-hmm. on Lord of the Rings from Tolkien's own other writings, right? So, you know, things from the Silmarillion. By the way, I hope the space heater noise isn't too overwhelming. It's cold out here, so 
you know, and I personally would be able to, you know, get through it, but mm -hmm. Greta will complain if it gets yeah, too cold. Yeah, blame it on me, blame so, it on me. Uh, if there's if, if there's a little bit of white noise right now, then uh, that's why. So, sorry about well, that. Well, listen, y'all get to choose. You either get the space heater noise or you get my chattering teeth. Yeah. So, space heater is probably a little bit more easy to listen to. I think it's probably overstating the case, but... No, I don't think so. All right. So, anyway, I... I just looking through this book already, this this Lord of the Rings, a Reader's Companion, I I wish I'd had this thing from the very beginning. Mm, you know, that good, it, there's huh? so much. I mean, it's definitely not light reading, but it's it's like in a chapter like this where there's so much there's mm -hmm. there's so much detail and mm -hmm. and, um, and there's all these like little sayings that you're like, what exactly does that mean, or you know, what does that have to do with? Or there's just interesting questions like, you know, what what do we make of this whole, you know exchange between Eowyn and Faramir that, that's the centerpiece of this chapter um, there's just a lot of good discussion a lot yeah. of and, and, and excerpts from Tolkien's letters and other writings that help illuminate what he was thinking about as cool. he wrote these things it's not like a commentary like yeah. a so I'm a re chapters. I plan on referencing this a couple of times in, in this week's episode and probably you know going forward um, and who knows maybe you know maybe I'll do uh, some special maybe we'll do some special episodes in the future where we take specific sections of Lord of the Rings and and use the Reader's Companion. Oh, neato. Okay. So I highly recommend going and buying. It looks this really thing. pretty too. It is. It's a really, really it look, it'll look great on a bookshelf. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm not I'm not being paid to advertise this by the way. I'm just there. Right. This thing is great. I'm already using it. And if you're a hardcore Tolkien nerd like me and you like digging into these things, then this is a great reference. So it's. Um, Wayne Hammond and Christina Skoll, uh, The Lord of the Rings, A Reader's Companion. So go pick it up. Um, okay, so um, we do, before we dive in, I do need to do a, um, a book drawing for oh, our Patreon, Patreon folks for December. All right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let me make sure, let me make sure I've got the latest person on there. Give me one moment while I go and look this up on, on my Patreon site here. So, probably should have done this earlier, but sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just thinking the same thing. Well, mm -hmm. okay, well, well, here we go. Yep, so Spencer Foger, he's he's our oh, last guy to be added. Awesome. Uh, we Thanks, had mentioned Spencer. him on the last episode, but yeah, glad to have you on board, Spencer. Oh. Um, make sure we've still got all the same patrons with us. Looks that we do. So, one, two, three, four, five, six... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Awesome. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. here we go. Let's do it. Hey Siri, pick a number between 1 and 8. Super fan Josh. Super fan Josh Sosa, the original Yay, super fan. Yay, about time. Uh, Twitter jockey extraordinaire. Uh huh. Yes. So we'd be lost and on huge Twitter Star Wars him. fan who who you know at some point he and I need to talk about the Last Jedi because I did go see that and mm -hmm. I know he's probably got a lot of thoughts on it and I've got a lot of thoughts on it. So, uh, but anyway, I have zero thoughts. On super that. fan Josh, I'll be in touch finding out what you want, which book you want. So, thanks to all of our patrons. Yes, you guys thank rock. you guys. You. Are awesome songs. Rocking the extreme, especially because I've kind of not done much for you guys in a few months, and I've, you know, slacked a little bit on the December episode, so, but you guys stick with us, and we appreciate yes, it. Yes, very loyal. Um, you know, we're just so, so blessed by each and every one of you. Um, okay, so, Lord of the Rings, Book 6, Chapter 5, The Steward and the King. I'm getting hot because of the space heater. All right, turn it off. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. All it's right. fine. I'd rather you not be sweating. So, well, maybe maybe I want to sweat. <laughs> well, maybe you should sweat. Maybe detox I should. from all that Christmas goodness. Yeah, with it's, it's still goodness, going why, on. why do I need to detox from it? Because it's too much of it. Oh, I see. You know, all things in moderation. Anyway. Okay. Moving on. So, the chapter begins, and it, you know, so so the field of Cormallen uh, was the last chapter, and the field of Cormallen, of course takes place after the destruction of the ring. Frodo and Sam are rescued as, as Mount Doom is uh, crumbling and this great apocalyptic thing is happening with the end of Sauron's reign. Um, and then we wind up in the Field of Cormallen, which is a place in Ithilien, the eastern 
the 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 eastern bank of the Anduin River, yep. right? That mm-hmm. used to be part of the Gondor realm, but now is more given over to now it was more given over to the forces of Mordor. But um, the field of they 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 come to the field of Cormallan and the the hobbits receive lots of praise, and it's a really beautiful chapter after all this, you know, um, after all this, you know, bleakness and the danger of the first, uh, three chapters of Mm -hmm. book six. Right. So after the field of Cormallan, we go back to Minas Tirith, where we pick up two days after the men, the captains of the West had departed, right? Had departed to, to do battle with Sauron. Yes. So this, this goes back in time a little bit. All right. So we hit rewind on yes, the timeline. Yes. And it's two days, which means it's five days before the destruction of the ring. Okay. Okay. Five days before the destruction of the ring is where we're at. So it's a flashback. Yeah. Flat. I guess you could call it that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and we, you know, essentially the first the first half of this chapter deals with Faramir and Eowyn. Um, so I'm just I'm going to start out by you know actually you want to start out read the first um, paragraph or two of this chapter. Sure. Over the city of Gondor, doubt and great dread had hung. Fair weather and clear sun had seemed but a mockery to men whose days held little hope, and who looked each morning for news of doom. Their lord was dead and burned. Dead lay the king of Rohan in their citadel, and the new king that had come to them in the night was gone again to a war with powers too dark and terrible for any might or valor to conquer. And no news came. After the host left Morgul Vale and took the northward road beneath the shadow of the mountains, no messenger had returned nor any rumor of what was passing in the brooding east. When the captains were but two days gone, the Lady Eowyn bade the women who tended her to bring her raiment, and she would not be gainsaid, but rose, and when they had clothed her and set her arm in a sling of linen, she went to the warden of the houses of healing. Keep uh... Yeah, well, that, that's good. We, okay. can, we can pause there. So um, so basically what I want to highlight here is that there was this, this is a time of great dread. So even though they had won the, bat, the battle of the Pelennor Fields, um, the captains of the West had departed, and there was not a lot of hopefulness. They're, remember, they, they leave thinking they're probably not coming back. They're, they're, this is their, this is their um, attempt, and they don't think there's a lot of chance that it's going to succeed, but this is their attempt to try and draw Sauron mm-hmm. away from Mount Doom in order to open up a path for Frodo and Sam. Right. Who they believe to still be alive. Right. 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 So it's, um, a, it's a journey. Like, it's a, like, I mean, it's a really... It's almost like a suicide mission. It, I, it is, yes. But I was going to say, I just feel like it takes, like, their faith in Sam and Frodo is, it's got to be super high. Right. Right? Because, I mean, why would they put their lives at risk if they had any doubt that they wouldn't still be alive, right? You know, right. Well, you know, it's it's like it's like in um, you know in football or something like that when you know you have a the the you know a running back like or a quarterback fakes the handoff to a running back and the running back runs over to the left side and every, all the defense thinks he has yeah. the ball and right. so they just clobber him right and then the quarterback sneaks around the other side right going for the touchdown yeah right the running back gets clobbered so mm. that the quarterback can get right. So here, the, the army score, is the right? is the running back. Right. The the yeah. captains of the West are the running back who, yeah. who are allowing themselves to get clobbered. Right. Um, They're sacrificing themselves. Right. Yeah. Exactly. To help make the way clear <clears throat> for Sam and Frodo. Exactly. So, um, you know, it, it's not a suicide mission in the sense of like, you know, they're they're going just to kill themselves. They're going in order to draw Sauron away, and they don't have a great expectation mm-hmm. of succeeding in surviving. Right. 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 But, but they're uh, still willing to try, which is awesome. Exactly. So, um, so this casts a shadow over the whole, you know, over everybody who's left in Minas Tirith because there's even though they've just won the battle of Pelennor Fields, there's not a lot of hope that the captains of the West are coming back. And these are important men, like our right, gun, yeah, like Aemon. Yeah, these are yeah um, high-ranking officials. Right. Yeah, you know, leaders. Uh, the Prince of Dol Amroth. Yes. Um, you know, lots of lots of important men. Yeah. So. That's a shadow that's hanging over them all. And Eowyn, who is recovering in, uh, in Minas Tirith, is under the care of the Master Warden, um, you know, basically in the, house, in the Houses of Healing, under the care of the Master Warden. And she's, rest, she's getting restless, right? She, yeah. wants, she actually wants to leave. Mm-hmm. She wants to leave and go, go to battle. Yeah. And the Master Warden's like, I can't do that. 
Um, only, only the Lord who's left in charge, Faramir, mm -hmm. is capable of granting that to you. Right. And so that leads to Eowyn and Faramir uh, and their interaction in this chapter. Yes. So, um, flash forward a little bit. The warden introduces them to each other. Uh, mass, my lord, here is the Lady Eowyn of Rohan. She rode with the king and was sorely hurt and dwells now in my keeping, but she is not content and she wishes to speak to the steward of the city. Um, and uh, and then ward, the warden departs, and so it's just Faramir and Eowyn speaking. He asks, What would you have me do, lady? I am also a prisoner of the healers. Um, what do you wish? If it lies in my power, I will do it. She says, I would have you command this warden and bid him let me go. Um, she guessed that this tall man, both stern and gentle, might think her merely awkward or merely wayward, like a child that has not the firmness of mind to go on with a dull task to the end. I myself am in the warden's keeping, answered Faramir, nor have I yet taken up my authority in the city. But had I done so, I should still listen to his counsel and should not cross his will in matters of his craft, unless in some great need. And she says, but I do not desire healing. I wish to ride to war like my brother Eomer, or better, like Theoden the king. For he died and has both honor and peace. Um, to this Faramir says, It is too late, lady, to follow the captains, even if you had the strength. But death and battle may come to us all yet, willing or unwilling. You will be better prepared to face it in your own manner, if while there is still time you do as the healer commanded. You and I, we must endure with patience the hours of waiting. So, Eowyn is, I guess just spiritually, in very, very bad shape, mm -hmm. right? I mean, for um, good reason. Well, well, I think I would be too. It, I mean, can't, can't elaborate. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm just saying. I mean, she's lost her father figure, mm -hmm. right? Um, she's her uh, <clears throat> her brother has left, and she, there's a decent chance she's never going to see him again, right? Um, and just like no, like just her personality. She's a very strong female character in this book right yeah. and she not only does she feel like she's lost everything dear to her at this point but now she she can't do anything about it like they won't even let her do the one thing that she feels like she can do you know yeah. i mean mm -hmm. i think she must feel just hopeless on every front at this point i mean yeah. lost lonely um yeah i mean i think it's amazing that she's you know i don't want to get too far ahead of myself but i love how she, like her, how she, how she transforms, mm -hmm. how her outlook transforms throughout this chapter. Um, but at this point, I mean, she has every reason to be in the, in despair. Don't you think? I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, um, I think it's interesting. I think there's a deeper issue here that it gets into later in the chapter. And that, you know, I'm interested to get your thought if you agree with me, but I feel like a lot of the things she brings up um, I think, I think, I think she feels those things, but I think at root, you know, it's like it's sometimes when you're just in a funk, uh, spiritually, like there's, there's certain things that you kind of would explain to others are bothering you, but then you get down to the root of it and there's something deeper, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we see in this chapter that the deeper thing for her is, um, that she know like that she feels this great love for Aragorn yeah, and she knows that it, it's not possible. Yeah. Right, that it's not going to happen. Yeah, um, that's a yeah, that's a difficult thing, you know. It and, is, and, she, yeah. and she probably doesn't want to just come right out and say it to this guy Faramir, mm -hmm. who she's just met. Like, mm -hmm. I'm totally head over heels, mm -hmm. you know, for this, you know, figure Aragorn. And it's not this isn't like you know, who am I going to prom with? Love, you know yeah. this. This is a much like nobler thing. This I is think, like a for, soulmate kind of thing. Yeah, think, she yeah. she she just finds in him like this this magnificent man mm -hmm. and. Um, wise, handsome, mm -hmm. strong, a great leader. Mm -hmm. She looks to him not just as like, it's not just this crush, this romantic crush, but it's this, it's this just great sense of admiration and respect. Yeah, and respect. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I see that as being at root of this because, you know, she lists off her reasons that she's not happy. You know, initially she's, you know, she kind of hints that she wants to be out doing battle. Mm -hmm. And why does she really want to be out there? You well, because Aragorn's out there. Exactly. Yeah. She wants to be with him. And yeah. I think she truly wants to be with him fighting. Yes. Right. Yeah. Not just to hang out with him. Like, she, yeah, she wants to be useful. Right. But she, yeah, I would agree. It's not that she wants to be, just be in his presence and like right. bathe in his 
you know, handsomeness. Yeah. But, I mean, that would be a nice little icing on the cake. But I think you're right. right. I think at heart she does. She wants to be at his side. Mm -hmm. She wants to be his helpmate. Yeah. 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 Um, but, I mean, it's, she clearly doesn't do a good job of hiding this because, I mean, Faramir totally picks up on it. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he he figures it out pretty right. quick. Right. Well, yeah, and, you know, jumping, jumping forward just a paragraph or two. Um, well, it says... And then she says, oh, if only my window were facing east, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, well, I can help you with that. I can make sure you have a right. window that's facing east. Right, 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 yeah. And, but, you know, so that's all that's bothering you. We'll take care of that, right? Yes. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, that's not what's really, you know. <laughs> um, a doofus. Uh, he says, you, you and I, we must endure with patience the hours of waiting. Um, a tear sprang in her eye and fell down her cheek like a glistening raindrop. Um, he, her ha proud head drooped a little, then quietly more as if speaking to herself than to him. But the healers would have me lie abed seven days yet. And my, my window does not look eastward. So there we go. That's the, that's the eastward yeah. window thing. Mm -hmm. He says that can be amended and this I will command the warden. Um, if I would, it would ease my care if you would speak to me or walk at wiles with me. Um, how should I ease your care, my Lord? And I do not desire the speech of living men. Would you have my plain answer, he said. I would. Then Eowyn of Rohan, I say to you that you are beautiful. In the, valley, in the valleys of our hills there are flowers fair and bright, and maidens fairer still. But neither flower nor lady have I seen till now in Gondor so lovely and so sorrowful. It may be that only a few days are left ere darkness falls upon our world, and when it comes I hope to face it steadily. But it would ease my heart if, while the sun yet shines, I could see you still. For you and I have both passed under the wings of the shadow, and the same hand drew us back. Alas, not me, Lord, she said. Shadow lies on me still. Look not to me for healing. I am a shield maiden, and my hand is ungentle. But I thank you for this at least, that I need not keep to my chamber. I will walk abroad by the grace of the steward of the city. And she did him a courtesy and walked back to the house. But Faramir for a long while walked alone in the garden, and the glance now strayed rather to the house than to the eastward walls. So, um, you know, a Aomer, I'm sorry, Faramir's response to Eowyn is, um, you know, I, I would really like your companionship. This is mm -hmm. all the time we have left, and I would really mm -hmm. like your companionship. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah. And Eowyn is just, she's not willing, you know, she, she's just in this spiritual darkness, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's you know she says the shadow has not yet departed from me, right? Mm -hmm. It still hangs over me, mm -hmm. in a very deep way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of stubbornness, right? And you know, there's a little bit of stubbornness just to even, you know, because you're like, what could it hurt just to spend some time with this with this man? Like you know, there's mm -hmm. there's not it's not like there's somebody else who you around who you'd rather be spending time right. with, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, this is. I mean, do you think do you think Aowen is a little bit self pitying here? Like, is there a little bit of fault in her? I mean, I'm not saying all fault, but I'm saying right. is there a little bit of fault in her? Yeah, I think there is. I think there is. Yeah. Um, of course, it's easy for us to see. Sure. Uh, you know, being on the outside looking in, because I know you and I. You know, I think everybody goes through this kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? And where you're just, yeah. Sometimes you just you need time to just kind of circle the wagons and kind of delve inward and just kind of it's almost like the course of a virus right it's just got to run its course mm -hmm. and no matter what you know what people as hard as people try to break you out of it cheer you up whatever it's almost it's almost like it's it's just something you've got to get through like your heart has got to change mm -hmm. and sometimes there's some divine you know, there's some divine power that needs to work too. Yeah. Especially here. But I, I do think, yeah, I, I remember being a little annoyed with her at this point. I mean, I was like, I'm not, it's not like Farmir. Like, I get, like, you have the hots for Aragorn. Like, I get that, right? But here's Farmir, who's like, I mean, he's a steward. Yeah. He's pretty darn handsome, and he wants your company. And he's a great, he's a man that's extremely respected. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, a great hero. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, I've been in this situation too. I mean, I've had. You know, I've had different experiences where my girlfriends have been like, what's wrong with you? Why won't you go out with him or whatever? I'm just like, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I can relate a Hopefully little bit. Hopefully not too recently. No, no of course <laughs> not too recently. Please. We've been married, what, 15 years now? No, I'm just um, no, no, what you're talking about. No, the same know, thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's just like, 
you know, you they can't see it, but it's just not, you know, it's just not what anyone thinks she needs right now. Right. As good as a thing as it could be, you know. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to reach for the book and slap her here at this point, I'll be honest, but... Yeah. You know, but I get it. I've totally been where she is. Mm -hmm. And it can be hard. It, it can be really, nothing can bring you out of it a lot of the times. Just has to run its course. It just course. has to run its course. Yeah. So fast forwarding a little bit, um, we get to the fifth day since, uh, so if we fast forward five days. And so the fifth day, if you do that math, that's going to be the day of the destruction of the ring. So um, they meet up again. Um uh, the lady Eowyn went first to Faramir, and they stood now together once more upon the walls of the city and looked out. No tidings had yet come, and all hearts were darkened. The weather, too, was bright no longer. It was cold. The wind that had sprung up in the night was blowing now keenly from the north, and it was rising. But the lands about looked gray and, and drear. They were clad in warm raiment and heavy cloaks, and over all the lady Eowyn wore a great blue mantle of the color of deep summer night, and it was set with silver stars about him and throat. Faramir had sent for this robe and had wrapped it about her, and he thought that she looked fair and queenly indeed as she stood there at his side. The mantle was wrought for his mother, Fenduilus of Amroth, who died untimely, and it was to him but a memory of loveliness in far days and of his first grief. And her robe seemed to him raiment fitting for the beauty and sadness of Eowyn. And he says to her, What do you look for, Eowyn? And she says, Does not the black gate lie yonder, and must he not now be come thither? It is seven days since he rode away. Seven days, said Faramir, but think not ill of me if I say to you, they have brought me both a joy and a pain that I never thought to know. Joy to see you, but pain, because now the fear and doubt of this evil time are grown dark indeed. Eowyn, I would not have this world in now, or lose so soon what I have found. She says, Look, lose what you have found, Lord. I know not what in these days you have found that you could lose, but come, my friend, let us not speak of it. Let us not speak at all. I stand upon some dreadful brink, and it is utterly dark in the abyss before my feet. But whether there is any light behind me, I cannot tell. For I cannot turn yet. I wait for some stroke of doom. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, like, the way that uh, she internalizes this. And, you know, for Tolkien writing this, he, like, you know, he, he internalizes this um, this setup kind of, you know, and we, and we know the outcome here, but... Um, he internalizes this setup of you catastrophe, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an external thing that's going on, but you know this this moment of seeming hopelessness is internalized with Eowyn, right? Right, in a strong yeah. way, yeah. Right, um, you know, she just, just the language here is just like I mean, it's it's border. I mean, it's just borderline suicidal, right? It's like I stand, it is, yeah. I stand before this abyss, mm -hmm. right? This abyss mm -hmm. in my mind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a scary place to be. Yeah, really scary. Um, and, and, and Faramir basically agrees. He says, yes, we wait for the stroke of doom. Um, and it seemed to them that it, as they stood upon the wall, that the wind died and the light failed and the sun was bleared. And, it all, and all sounds in the city or in the lands about were hushed. Neither wind nor voice nor bird call nor rustle of leaf nor their own breath could be heard. The very beating of their hearts was stilled. Time halted. And so they stood and so they stood. You know, why don't you read, pick up there, and as they stood, okay. stood so. And as they stood so, their hands met and clasped, though they did not know it, and still they waited, for they knew not what. Then presently it seemed to them that above the ridges of the distant mountains another vast mountain of darkness rose, towering up like a wave that should engulf the world, and about it lightnings flickered. And then a tremor ran through the earth, and they felt the walls of the city quiver. A sound like a sigh went up from all the lands about them, and their hearts beat suddenly again. It reminds me of Numenor, said Faramir, and wondered to hear himself speak. Of Numenor, said Eowyn. Yes, said Faramir, of the land of Western Essie, that foundered, and of all the great dark wave climbing over the green lands and above the hills and coming on, darkness unescapable. I often dream of it. Then you think that the darkness is coming, said Eowyn, darkness unescapable? And suddenly she drew close to him. No, said Faramir, looking into her face. It was but a picture in the mind. I do not know what is happening. The reason of my, walk, of my waking mind tells me that great evil has befallen and we stand at the end of days. But my heart says nay, and all my limbs are light and a hope and joy are come to me that no reason can deny. Eowyn, Eowyn, white lady of Rohan, in this hour I do not believe that any darkness will endure. And he stooped and kissed her brow. So... Uh, this is, you know, this is a pretty interesting scene. So, 
Uh, I like what Faramir hit, says, where he says, my mind tells me that, yes, doom is upon us. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like his rational nature. Yeah, but in says his heart. Doom is upon us, but in his heart, it says it's not so. Right. Which is an interesting dynamic, because usually, well... I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just it's interesting that you know his, that his mind is saying this to him, and his and his uh, heart, and even his kind of his body is saying otherwise, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. He feels this yeah. strange spirit. So it's almost like there's an intu- there's an intuition, right? That he yes. has, right? For some and because reason, because he's not in that same darkness that mm-hmm. Eowyn is, he's able to to perceive that. Do you think? Maybe, maybe that has something to do with it too. I also want to point out real quick. I loved. Um, you know, this is a really, dark, overall, I mean, it gets lighter at the end, but this is overall a very dark scene, mm-hmm. right? Where it talks about the birds being silent and the city sounds, you know, is hushed and the sun's bleak. I mean, all this darkness. But right before that, this, you know, when it describes this blue, this cloak, this mantle that Eowyn, that he put around Eowyn, mm-hmm. I've, I really felt like this was a very clear Marian image. Hmm. With the blue mantle and the stars on it, it just made me think of yeah, maybe even Our Lady of Guadalupe. Hmm. Um, and you just think it's—I can't help but think it's some kind of foreshadowing hmm. to what's going to happen. Like it's this little glimmer of hope, like this image of you know of this mm-hmm. Marian, this Queen of Heaven, Mother of all creation, kind of present, right. even in the midst of this darkness, foreshadowing. A type of salvation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and, and and stars obviously are a, uh, play a huge role in uh, the entire mythology of Middle Earth mm-hmm. because of yeah Varda, right? Mm-hmm. Varda, queen of the stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know she was the one that awoke. Her stars were the she put the stars in the sky. She hung the stars in the sky and um, and awoke the uh, elves right. for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, she's always, she's always kind of played that role. And you think yeah. about like the incantation, um, uh, or the invocation of Elbereth Varda mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by, uh, by Sam and Frodo yep. in different times as they yep. were in that in their journey, in yeah. their journey mm-hmm. um, to Mount Doom. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. Interesting little bit of foreshadowing. It's also mm-hmm. interesting to, to ponder like Faramir, um, he, he rem- this cloak was something that he had that he had last seen his mother wear, and yeah. his mother had apparently passed away a long time ago, mm-hmm. which is interesting to maybe explain a little bit of Denethor's own darkness, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yes. Yeah, that his mm-hmm. wife passed away so long before, mm-hmm. you know, he was, you know, before he did, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. So he lived as a widower for so long. Yes. Right. Um. Uh. So you know, there, there's a. Yeah, I, I I definitely can see what your point there and be, mm-hmm. being foreshadowing of you know. And it's a sign hope. of hope too for Eowyn, I right. think. It's almost like you know Faramir is trying to clothe her with hope, an external yes, hope, an external right? hope, and I and it's just a very touching. Um, it's just a very yeah, it's just a very touching scene that he would share this dear, um, you know, this dear memorabilia, if you will, of his mother with her mm-hmm. you know i mean i think that shows that he is already deeply in love with her yeah you know i mean you gave me your grandmother's ring when you proposed to me and there's just something really special about you know that that sharing of of things that that have a family history yeah to them yeah that's true um so and i and i just love his um you know just you can feel his own certainty, mm-hmm. right? Eowyn, mm-hmm. Eowyn, White Lady of Rohan, in this hour I do not believe that any darkness will endure, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's almost a... That's almost prophetic. It, yeah, it's like a, it's like a religious statement, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's, like mm-hmm. a, it's like a statement of like religious... Um, a religious certainty, yes. right? Um, my, my reason, my mind tells me otherwise, but... I, I know with certainty that my mind is wrong, right? Yeah. That the things I see before me are wrong, yeah. right? Yeah. That this, that the darkness will not endure, right? And, you know, it's it's like, 
we've had other discussions that even you know, there's 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 seen several chapters ago, and maybe I think it was Frodo and Sam. It may have been it may have been Gandalf, but I think it was Frodo and Sam where they're talking and they're like, even if we fail, the shadow is but a passing thing, mm-hmm. right? Even if we fail in our mission right here and Sauron wins the victory of this battle that won't, like, he's still going to lose ultimately, right? Just like yeah. Melkor lost ultimately. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, it's, the shadow is a passing thing. And that's almost like what Faramir is channeling here. He, does, he They don't know yet what act, what has happened because what we're actually seeing is the destruction of the ring. The, the ring has been destroyed in this moment. And right. They don't know it yet. Right, yeah. Um, but that's the sigh of the land, right? Mm-hmm. We see it mirrored in the other chapters to talk about that. Um and, you know, all of a sudden he's filled with this certainty, right? That the shadow is a passing thing, that the darkness will not endure. Even if it overwhelms their lives, right? Yeah. It, it's a passing thing. It's ultimately a passing thing. That's just, it's such a huge theme of this book. Theme of this book yeah, you're um, absolutely right. That even, even when darkness may overcome us individually, um, we, we pray that it doesn't, but even if it should overcome us individually, the shadow is a passing thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even in our world. Um, and so they stood on the walls of the city of Gondor, and a great wind rose and blew, and their hair, raven and golden, streamed out, mingling in the air. And the shadow departed, and the sun was unveiled, and light leaped forth, and the waters of Anduin shone like silver. And in all the houses of the city, men sang for the joy that welled up in their hearts from what source they could not tell. Again, it's this mysterious source of joy they don't mm-hmm. know yet. They haven't received any actual sensory news right right no but there's an intuition it's like yeah. it's like the world is crying out yes and within them yeah is in this mysterious mm-hmm. way that um the darkness has passed right um and then the eagle comes the eagle the eagle sings um <clears throat> sing now you people of the tower of honor for the realm of sauron is ended forever and the dark tower is thrown down sing and rejoice ye people of the tower of guard For your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the west, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places, and the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. And the people sang in all the ways of the city. Uh, It's interesting to me that the first reference that the eagle uses is to the Tower of Anor, right? So originally, right, Minas Tirith was known as the Tower of Anor, and oh. Minas Morgul was known as the ta- uh, the uh, Minas Ithil, right? Yes. So okay. Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun, Minas Ithil, the Tower of the Moon, right? And um, so, and it's juxtaposed with the Dark Tower, right? This Tower of the Sun, mm. he's telling them to sing for the Dark Tower is thrown down. Yes. Has been thrown down. Yes. So. Uh, you know, cool little note there yeah, about that, yeah. about the song of the eagle. So, um, days follow, they were golden, and the spring and summer joined and made revel together in, in the fields of Gondor. And tidings now came by swift riders from Carondros of all that was done. So, a, a, a good time, a good amount of time passes. Um, people start departing for um, the field of Cormalan mm-hmm. uh, to go and, to go and uh, kind of join in the festivities there. The captains of the West have not yet come back to uh, Minas Tirith. Right. Right. So Faramir, um, I think Faramir can't depart because he's the steward, right? He's Yeah, uh, because he's the steward of Minas Tirith. Right. Um, so he needs to wait for Aragorn to return before he goes anywhere. Yes. Um, but he's surprised that Eowyn doesn't go because... Eomer has called for her, wants her to, to come and, and join him at the Field right, of Right, the Field of Cormorland, yes. So it says, Faramir wondered at this, but he saw her seldom, being busy with many matters, and she dwelt still in the houses of healing, and walked alone in the garden, and her face grew pale again, and it seemed that in all the city she only was ailing and sorrowful. And the warden of the houses was troubled, and he spoke to Faramir. Um, Eowyn, why do you... Uh, and so Faramir comes to her and says, Eowyn, why do you tarry here, and do not go to the rejoicing in Cormalan beyond Carondros, where your brother awaits you? Do you not know, she says. He answers, two reasons there may be, but which is true, I do not know. And she said, I do not wish to play at riddles. Speak plainer. Then if you will have it so, lady, he said, you do not go, because only your brother called for you, and to look on the Lord Aragorn, Elendil's heir, and his triumph would now bring you no joy. 
or because I do not go, and you desire still to be near me. And may be for both these reasons, and you yourself cannot choose between them. Eowyn, do you not love me, or will you not? She says, I wish to be loved by another, she answered, but I desire no man's pity. She just needs some, Mm -hmm. she needs some uh, Stephen Stills right here. Stephen Stills? Yeah, some Stephen Stills. I don't know what you're talking about. And if you can't be with the Uh, one you love, honey, love love the the one you're with. with. Love the one you're with. You're right. Yeah. Yep, you're right. It's a cool song. That is a cool song. I just don't know who wrote it. Yeah, it's Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Got it. Okay. Um. Yeah. You know, that's kind of, that's one of those songs, now that I think of it. Sorry, a little side note here is what I want to do when it comes to music, <laughs> right? But it's it's interesting, like the lyrics, think about the lyrics for that song. And there's a road, uh, let's, let's, in the distance, I don't know, and the <laughs> eagle flies with the dove. Mm. Can't be. If you can't be with the one you love. Be with the one there you love. There it is. Lyrics. Let's see. Um, if you're down and confused and you don't remember who you're talking to, uh, concentration slip away because your baby is so far away. Well, there's a rose and a fisted glove and the eagle flies with the dove. And if you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Don't be angry. Don't be sad. And don't sit crying over good times you had. There's a girl right next to you and she's just waiting for something to do. And there's a rose and a fisted glove and the eagle flies with the dove. So, um, yeah, he obviously didn't write this for, uh, a woman. Right. Um, He wrote it for another (laughs) Uh, man, but um, turn your heartache right into joy. She's a girl and you're a boy. Get it together, make it nice. Ain't gonna need any more advice. Uh, but still, it's it's kind of interesting, like some of the some of the parallels. Yeah. Um, yeah so right. probably he wrote it after reading this chapter. Probably. That's my best guess. I think Tolkien definitely inspired this yeah, song. I'd say ninety five percent likely. Mm. Yeah. I might go ninety five point seven. Ninety five point seven. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Which would round up to ninety six. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, no good. Good insight, Johnny. Yeah. Very good insight. So eagle flies yeah. the dove. But you know, at least at least Eowyn is honest with herself, and she's honest with Farmer here. Yeah, like, she's not denying it. She's like, yeah, I don't want you. I want someone else. <laughs> yeah. Well, why, why don't you pick up um, that? I that I know. He said, "You desire to have the love of the Lord Aragorn." That I know. He said, "You desire to have the love of the Lord Aragorn, because he was high and puissant, and you wished." To have renown and glory and to be lifted far above the mean things that crawl on the earth. And as a great captain may to a young soldier, he seemed to you admirable. For so he is, a lord among men, the great, the greatest that now is. But when he gave you only understanding and pity, then you desired to have nothing, unless a brave death in battle. Look at me, Eowyn. And Eowyn looked at Farmir long and steadily, and Farmir said, Do not scorn pity, that is the gift of a gentle heart, Eowyn. But I do not offer you my pity, for you are a lady high and valiant, and have yourself won renown that shall not be forgotten. And you are a lady beautiful, I deem, beyond even the words of the elven tongue to tell. And I love you. Once I pitied your sorrow, but now, were you sorrowless, without fear or any lack, were you the blissful queen of Gondor, still I would love you. Eowyn, do you not love me? Then the heart of Eowyn changed, or else that, or else at last she understood it, and suddenly her winter passed and the sun shone on her. So why do you think she changes all of a sudden? I don't know, and I gotta be honest here. I found it a little, a little hard to believe. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a woman. Like I'm, apart from some kind of divine inspiration, our hearts just don't boom change like that. I feel like maybe Tolkien got tired, and he felt like maybe he would, had drawn this out too long already. He just wanted it to be over. Yeah. So I don't know. I, it is a little bit abrupt, but it is. you know, do you think? Do you think? Um, I, you know, she she has been through a lot, and I know we were we, we have said some critical things of her, but at the mm-hmm. same time, she's lost her father or not her uncle, who was extremely yeah. dear to her. Sure, right? Um, and then she lo- you know she loses a, this other man, and and so and there, yeah, there's a willful like there's a willfulness and a stubbornness. Yeah, she wants is. she's used to having things her way. She's a she's getting what she wants. She's yeah. you know one of the highest ranking people in Rohan, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And here she. She sees this man and she can't have and and she can't have him in Aragorn, mm-hmm. right? And then Eomer finally, like very, I think Faramir. I'm sorry, Faramir, very bravely 
um, just kind of like lays it all out. Lays it all out. It yeah. says, "Okay, you want me to speak plainly? I'll tell you what mm -hmm. I think." Right? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like when he when he's when he doesn't actually act like he's pitying her mm -hmm. and just kind of like you know grabs her kind of by the head and looks looks in her eyes and mm -hmm. says this firmly to her. Mm -hmm. um, it's it. It changes her, yeah. right? You know, I think there's something to that, absolutely. You know, I think um, strong personalities, especially, they, they don't, like, they want someone to stand up to them yeah. and push back. Yeah. And that's what Faramir does here. And I think maybe, I don't, I mean, I, I feel like it was, I still feel like it was too abrupt. Yeah. Um, but I can see where Faramir's words would have had a, a profound effect on her at this point. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's she he said what she had been waiting and wanting to hear. Well, and we have to keep in mind that the external shadow had departed. That's true. Right? And it That's had been true. gone for several days yeah. at least. Yeah. Right? So there were other things that were warm that were probably warming her up. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, there's probably some stuff happening behind the scenes for sure. You know? Yeah. Um, but so coming back to the reader's companion that I was referring to at the beginning mm -hmm. of this episode. Mm -hmm. Um Tolkien actually wrote about this in one of his letters, so I want to um, I want to read what he has to say about this, what they reference. This is on page 631 of The Reader's Companion. Okay. This is to an unnamed correspondent concerning Faramir and Eowyn. It is possible to love more than one person of the other sex at the same time, but in a different mode and intensity. I do not think that Eowyn's feelings for Aragorn really changed much. And when he was revealed as so lofty a figure in descent and office... She was able to go on loving and admiring him. He was old, and that is not only a physical quality. When not accompanied by any physical decay, age can be alarming or awe-inspiring. Also, she was not herself ambitious in the true political sense. Though not a dry nurse in temper, she was also not really a soldier or Amazon, but like many brave women was, but like many brave women was capable of great military gallantry at a crisis. Regarding criticism of the speed of the relationship or love of Faramir and Eowyn, in my experience, in my experience, feelings and decisions ripen very quickly, as measured by mere clock time, which is actually not justly applicable, in periods of great stress, and especially under the ex expectation of imminent death. And I do not think that persons of high estate and breeding need all the petty fencing and approaches in matters of love. This tale does not deal with a period of courtly love and its pretenses. But with a more with a culture more primitive, uh, i.e., less corrupt and nobler, some critics have, object, have objected uh, to Eowyn's acceptance of a domestic role as Faramir's wife. But her role would have been no different had she married Aragorn as she had earlier hoped. Her change of heart most especially reflects Tolkien's belief. This is actually Skull and Hammond saying this. Her change of heart especially reflects Tolkien's belief that conflict and battle should not be exalted, but embraced only at need. Eowyn turns from the more martial ethos of the Rohirrim to the higher ideals described by Faramir, in which craft and skill are more valued than prowess at war. So, huh. um, so you know that that's a helpful little section that he says there, mm -hmm. right? He, you know, he's he basically makes the point that look, the periods of great stress, especially of of war and of doom hanging over you, right? Mm -hmm. um, feeling, you know, it. And, and Tolkien could speak on this, right? He went mm -hmm. through World War One, yeah. Um, you know, that was when, uh, even though he had been with, um, Edith for year before World War One, right? Their, their romance had started before World War One. Um, I believe they were married during it, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and, and obviously, you know, a lot of the stories, like the story of Baron and Luthien was first conceived in that time period, right? In World War One, when he was mm. on leave, right? Yeah, that's When true. he was away, right? Mm -hmm. You think about the love of Baron and Luthien and that, mm -hmm. that story, right? And it's a it's a thing that happens very quickly, right? They, they, true. they first come upon each other. True, so, yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and to be sure, like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not like this just happened. It's not like, there's a lot that leads up to this, right? And yes, Eowyn, the Eowyn changes, mm -hmm. but it's almost like a weight is lifted, is finally lifted from her heart at, mm -hmm. at uh, Faramir's words, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's he, like he yeah. shatters, he shatters this thing that was imprisoning her heart. Yes, right. I think, I think that's true. Yeah, and I think he also maybe just helps. Her, he illuminates some things 
for her. Mm-hmm. I think I really like what Tolkien said there about um, about. I think she comes to realize through what Faramir says that yes, she loves Aragorn, but maybe not in the way that would make her a good wife to him. Mm-hmm. Like it's more of a respect and an admiration. Um, and she doesn't like she does. She really want to be queen, you know. No. Yeah. I mean, after watching The Crown, I know I would never want to be queen, I'll tell you that. Um, but also, Tolkien reminded me of something I wanted to say before when we were talking about her infatuation with Aragorn. I mean, like, he's old. He's way too old for her. Yeah. I mean, he's like thousands, of, well, maybe not thousands. No, not thousands. He's like hundreds of years old. Yeah. Right? I mean, he's aged very, very well. But Well, still, yeah, he's, he's Numenorean. Right, right? He's, but still, he's just yeah. too old. And um, so I think maybe, I think that what... Um, what Farmir says here, I think, just, yes, I think there has been weight lifted, and I think also it was his words were illuminating, and I think it helps her to see, like, clearly what's right in front of her, mm-hmm. right? I think it also helps that he doesn't pity her. He makes it clear exactly. that I don't pity you. Exactly, he pushes you. back, right? right? He's like, I know you're better than this. Like, yeah. get over yourself. Right. And I think people like Eowyn, that's what they, they, they need yeah. to hear that, mm-hmm. you know? It's funny, I did that, that personality test. That you told me to do a few weeks ago, and once you're done with it, it like gives you like some characters or people who are who kind of scored the same way you did. And Eowyn came up for me. Like oh, really? Eowyn and I apparently are very similar personality wise, huh. and so I can kind of relate to her in this in this sense and be like, when you're feeling when you're down on yourself and when you're feeling sorry for yourself, like you don't want people to feel sorry for you. Yeah. Like you you want them and you need them to just you know slap you. And mm-hmm. be like, get over it. Yeah. yeah. So, I think that's probably what Farmer does. Although it still bugs me that it happened so quickly. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit more gradual. I can see why that bugs people, but um, I think, you know, be open to what Tolkien is trying to say. No, about yeah. This, and particularly about the character. I think he, you know, that little back bit of background he has there helps illuminate his, his decision making there. I don't think he just got tired of it and yeah. decided to all of a sudden do this. He's, he was too much of a perfectionist to do that. Yeah, um, no, I think you're right. But that isn't kind of how it feels. Yeah. Because you're like, you know, it was just, it, it, yeah, I've probably said enough about it. It's an interesting question. We don't have to, you know, not to... I'd love to know what our listeners to. think. Yeah, you know. If they have any, you know, feelings feel, one way or the other. Feel free to send us your thoughts on it, most definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it made me happy. Like, it made me happy that finally Eowyn woke up. Yeah. But I I just would have liked to have not it not been so sudden. Right. I hear you. All right, so um, so finally, um, with that, uh, I, you know, just to wrap up what Eowyn says, I stand in Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun, and behold, the shadow has departed. I will be a shield maiden no longer, nor vie with the great riders, nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are not barren. No longer do I desire to be a queen. Uh, he says, this is well, for I am not a king, yet I will wed with the white lady of Rohan, if it be her will. And if she will, then let us cross the river, and in happier days, let us dwell in fair Athelion, and there make a garden. All things will grow with joy there, if the, light, if the white lady comes. Then must I leave my own people, man of Gondor? And would you have your proud folk say of you, there goes a lord who tamed a wild shield maiden of the north? Was there no woman of the race of Numenor to choose? I would, said Faramir. And he took her in his arms and kissed her under the sunlit sky, and he cared not that they stood upon that they stood high upon the walls in the sight of many. And many indeed saw them in the light that shone about them as they came down from the walls and went hand in hand to the houses of healing. Um, here's the Lady of Eowyn. Here's the Lady Eowyn of Rohan, and now she is healed. All right. Um, so she, you know, so there, you, there you go. Kind of the. A happy ending to the mm-hmm. story of Faramir and Eowyn. Mm-hmm. Um, so, following on this, the captains of the West do finally return. Um, folks, it says, Now the captains of the West led their host towards the city, and folks saw them advance in line upon line, flashing and glinting in the sunrise and rippling like silver. And so they came before the gateway and halted a furlong from the walls. As yet no gates had been set up again, but a barrier was laid across the entrance to the city, and there stood men at arms in silver and black with long swords drawn. Before the barrier stood Faramir, the steward, and Hurin, warden of the keys, and other captains of Gondor, and the Lady Eowyn of Rohan with Elfhelm the marshal, and many knights of the mark. And upon either side of the gate 
was a great press of fair people and raiment of many colors and garlands of towers. So now there was a wide space between the, before the walls of Minas Tirith, and it was hemmed in upon all sides by the knights and the soldiers of Gondor and of Rohan, and by the people of the city and of all parts of the land. A hush fell upon all as out from the host stepped the Dunedain in silver and gray, and before them came walking slow the Lord Aragorn. He was clad in black mail girt with silver, and he wore a long mantle of pure white clasped at the throat with a great jewel of green that shone from afar. But his head was bare, save for a star upon his forehead, bound by a slender fillet of silver. With him were Aomer of Rohan and the Prince Imrahil, and Gandalf robed, all in white, and four small figures that many men marveled to see. I do find this little bit with Aoreth and her, like, you know, the going to what she has to say about all of this funny. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just it's just a funny little thing, you know, here she's like, oh, I know all this. Let me tell you about what's going on here. Those aren't little princes. They're, yeah. those are the, uh, peri- you know, those are the halflings, right? Right, right. She's um, clearly the busybody. And then she always gets interrupted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Faramir goes with Horn of the Keys and no others, save that behind them walked four men in the high helms and armor of the Citadel, and they bore a great casket of black leberthon bound with silver. Faramir says to Aragorn, The last steward of Gondor begs leave to surrender his office. And he held out a white rod, but Aragorn took the rod and gave it back, saying, That office is not ended, and it shall be thine and thine heirs as long as my line shall last. Do now thy office. Hmm. Um, and Faramir says, Men of Gondor, hear now the steward of, the, of this realm. Behold, one has come to claim the kingship again at last. Here is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, chieftain of the Dunedain of Arnor, captain of the he- host of the West, Bearer of the Star of the North, wielder of the sword reforged, victorious in battle, whose hands bring bring healing, the Elfstone, Elisar of the line of Valandil, Isildur's Isildur's son, Elendil's son of Numenor. Shall he be king and enter into the city and dwell there? And of course they all say yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, jumping forward a little bit, well, we have the, the coronation and... Um, he decides that he wants to have Frodo carry the crown mm-hmm. to Gandalf. And he says, By the labor and valor of many, I have come into my inheritance. In token of this, I would have the ring bearer bring the crown to me and let Mithrandir set it upon my head if he will. For he has been, been the mover of all that has been accomplished, and this is his victory. So mm-hmm. it's ultimately Gandalf that crowns. Yeah. Um, Very appropriately so. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... You know, so behold the king, um, and then the reign of King Elasar begins. Mm-hmm. We have a little, you know, uh, epilogue to that part where it says, you want to read that last paragraph here, in his time the city. In his time the city was made more fair than it had ever been, even in the days of its first glory. And it was filled with trees and with fountains, and its gates were wrought of mithril and steel, and its streets were paved with white marble. And the folk of the mountain labored in it, and the folk of the wood rejoiced to come there. And all was healed and made good, and the houses were filled with men and women and the laughter of children. And no window was blind, nor any courtyard empty. And after the ending of the third age of the world into the new age, it preserved the memory and the glory of the years that were gone. Yeah, so... I want um, to go to there. Right, yeah, it sounds, sounds like a nice place. It does, yeah. So basically it's cool, like, you know, Gondor, after, you know, Minas Tirith, for, after for years it had been, you know, kind of at war and under siege, mm-hmm. and just living in this siege mentality, it begins this new age in Minas Tirith, right? Um, so very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, it's a joy for all these people, even the people who don't live there, it's a joy for them to come and visit it, you know, it's a... You know, it's a place, it's a it's a proud thing for them. Yeah. Right, a beautiful place and a proud yeah. place for them. Yeah, yeah, they're happy to call it, they're proud to call it home. Right. Yeah. And the home of their people. Right. Um, so, uh, in the next section we have some, you know, we have the pardonings of the peoples, the various pe- the men of various lands who had been enemies of Gondor, mm-hmm. right? So, and in, in kind of under, um, an alliance with Sauron. Uh, so, you know, this section really just shows the graciousness of Aragorn's yes. reign, right? Yes. Of King Elisar. Yeah. Exactly. Um, embassies came from many lands and peoples from the east and the south and from the borders of Mirkwood and from Dunlan and the west. And the king pardoned the Easterlings that had given themselves up and sent them away free. And he made peace with the peoples of Harad. And the slaves of Mordor he released and gave to them all the lands about Lake Nornan to be their own. And they were brought before him. And there were brought before him many to receive his praise and reward for their valor. And last, the captain of the guard brought to him Baragond to be judged. 
So recall Baragond was the one who had um, who had who had done battle with um, the people who were trying to slay Far who, who were trying to burn Faramir right right, right under yeah. Denethor's orders. Mm-hmm. So he had actually disobeyed right. He had yes. Then and to be called a traitor because of that right. right? So he comes before him, and you know great little scene here. Mm-hmm. Um, he he says Baragond by your sword blood was spilled in the hollows where that is forbidden. Also, you left your post without leave of lord or of captain. For these things of old, death was the penalty. Now, therefore, I must pronounce your doom. You know, Baragond is like, oh, what's going to happen to me? Yeah, right. He's probably seeing his life flash before his eyes. Right, and he says, all penalty is remitted for your valor in battle, and still more because all that you did was for the love of the Lord Faramir. Nonetheless, you must leave the guard of the citadel, and you must go forth from the city of Minas Tirith. So, I like how Aragorn's just like toying He's like him here. totally drawing it out here. Yeah. He's like, He's like, you're forgiven. You're forgiven, but, but you're exiled. You're exiled, yeah. No coming back. Yeah. Banished, banished from Minas Tirith. And <laughs> the blood left Baragon's face. And he was stricken mm. to the heart and bowed his head. But the king said, So it must be, for you are appointed to the White Company, the guard of Faramir, prince of Athelion. And you shall be its captain and dwell in Amen Arnon in honor and peace, and in the service of him for whom you risked all to save him from death. Um, and then Baragond, Baragond, perceiving the mercy and justice of the king, was glad, and kneeling, kissed his hand, and departed in joy and content. And Aragorn gave to Faramir Ithilien to be his princedom, and bade him dwell in the hills of Amon Arnon, within sight of the city. Um, so I, so I just love that little scene. You know, it mm-hmm. makes me tear up a little bit because mm-hmm. it is such a beautiful like scene of of true justice. Um, you know, Baragorn, Baragon has to take a big risk in order to save Faramir, mm-hmm. and he does it not knowing that he's not going to be punished later on for it. Right. But he does it because he believes it's the right thing to do. Yes. Right. The, the true law. Right. Mm-hmm. Rather than the established, rather than the established law, he follows mm-hmm. the true law. The moral law. Right. The yeah. greater moral law. Yeah. Right. Yep. And sometimes we're faced in life with situations where we have to do that, and it can be tough. Absolutely. Right? Especially for someone who is a military person. Because you are taught the importance of obedience and of duty, yes, right? And the loyalty and of to your listening, yeah, loyalty yeah. to your superiors and right. that kind of thing, right? Right. Um, so, you know, he, t- he took a big risk in doing this. Mm-hmm. He took a big risk, and um, and ultimately, it pays off for him. Yeah, justice um, was done. Justice is done uh, by King Elessar. So, an in, in interesting little note: Minas Sithil and Morgul Vale shall be utterly destroyed, and though it may in time, time to come, be made clean, no man may dwell there for many long years. So. Minas Ithil, Minas Morgul, is going to be destroyed completely, and yeah. the you know the kind of the ground about it laid to rest and to be renewed, mm-hmm. right, for some period of time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, good stuff. Interesting little note. Yeah, um, Aomer, um, they they so Aomer and Aragorn exchange words. Between us, there can be no word of giving or taking, nor of reward, for we are brethren. And happy hour did Aorel ride from the north, and never has any league of peoples been more blessed so that neither has ever failed the other, nor shall fail. Now, as you know, we have laid Theoden the renowned in a tomb in the hallows, and there he shall lie forever among the kings of Gondor, if you will. Or if you desire it, we will come to Rohan and bring him back to rest with his own people. Um, and Eowyn answered, Since the day when you rose before me out of the green grass of the downs, I have loved you, and that love shall not fail. But now I must depart for a while to my own realm, where there is much to heal and set in order. But as for the fallen, when all is made ready, we will return for him. But here, let him sleep a while. And now Eowyn said to Faramir, Now I must go back to my own land and look at it, on it once again and help my brother in his labor. But when one whom I long loved his father is laid at last to rest, I will return. So uh, that's kind of the, the outcome for Eowyn and Eomer mm-hmm. there and for the, the body of Theoden. Yeah. The people's, uh, the, the uh, companions of the ring dwell together in a time of happiness uh, for them. Mm-hmm. You see that note, and yeah. then, uh, and then we have this really last big scene in the chapter where uh, Gandalf and Aragorn go up into the hills, and um, and Gandalf kind of helps Aragorn to stumble upon this sapling of Nimloth, which was the great tree that had been passed down, that had been given to Numenor, which was a descendant of mm. uh, of the original two trees of Valinor, right? So this is a sign, kind of a, a you know even a sacramental sign of you know, of, of Gondor's relationship to Numenor and to, Mm. um, and and ultimately to Valinor, right? To the blessed realm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't know any, any kind of gloss over that, but any thoughts on that particular section? 
Um, I do think it's interesting where he says, Gandalf says, for the time comes of the dominion of men and the elder kindred shall fade or depart. And Gandalf even said, even says, my work is finished. I shall go soon. The burden must lie now upon you and your kindred. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and the, and the tree is really a sign that Aragorn's kingdom shall endure, right? Uh, for a long time. Right. Yeah, and then, um, right, and it says the sign, Argon, Aragorn says the sign has been given and the day is not far off. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's it's clearly a sign to the, you know, it's almost like his, uh, it's like the stars in the sky to Moses, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's the, or to Abraham, rather. Yeah. Um, this is his sign that, you know, his, his, his reign, his kingdom has been blessed. Mm -hmm. um, for many generations. And then, uh, I guess at the very end of the chapter, um, you have more visitors right. arrive, right? Gladriel, Caliborn, yep. Glorfindel, and Aristor. Mm -hmm. um, and Arwen. All right. Uh, Elrond. And, yeah, ultimately... And, and Frodo says to Gandalf, At last I understand why we have waited. This is the ending. Now not... Now not day only shall be beloved, but night too shall be beautiful and blessed, and all its fear pass away. Mm -hmm. Then the king welcomed his guests, and they alighted, and Elrond surrendered the scepter, and laid the hand of his daughter in the hand of the king, and together they went up into the city, and all the stars flowered in the sky. And Aragorn the king Elessar wedded Arwen and Dumiel in the city of the kings upon the day of midsummer, and the tale of their long waiting and labors was come to fulfillment. That's a romance in this chapter. Yep. Mm-hmm. A whole lot. Good stuff. And the end, we have the stars mentioned again, right? Right. With our ones. So they were mentioned with Aowen and mm -hmm. the mantle, right? And now here they are with Arwen and her marriage to uh, Arborn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of, lots of, I mean, just Beautiful what a great imagery. chapter. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, there was something else I think I wanted to read about in here. Um, and it was... Uh, it was. I'm on the other uh, seat. It was about the sapling. Well, no, it was about Faramir being given Ithilien. Um, oh. I, I don't. I, I don't know. That there's really a whole lot to cover with that. There is a lot of good stuff in this. You know, yeah. this, The reader's companion about this chapter. Um, a lot of stuff we're not going to mention. But um, go go get a copy of it. Check it out for yourselves. Yeah. Don't expect us to do all the work for you. That's Gosh. Right. Alrighty. Yes, yes, yes. Alright. You know what time it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haiku. Drop the mic. Thunk. Yes. All right. All right. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, Rock paper, paper, scissors, scissors shoot. shoot. I win. You win. I'm going to go first. I. Queen of heaven, queen of earth, of day, of night, all fear passes away. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. You get it? I think so. Good. All right. Um, so is it in reference to the, the robe she wears? Yeah. yeah. So I was, I, was, I was kind of referring to, uh, my thought was that Eowyn... The queen of, of earth, mm -hmm. Arwen, the queen of heaven. Ah, uh, I see. And then at the end where Frodo says that um, that both day and night will now be blessed. I was just trying to, you know, mm -hmm. draw the, do a little juxtaposition there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you a lot to think about. There's a couple of different mm -hmm. uh, ways I can see that. Yeah, applied. just the stars of the night. Right. And, well, you have you queen, know, of, queen of heaven in the sense of Varda. She's the right. queen of the heavens. Mm -hmm. Right. And the stars. And, and Arwen so the, being an elf. The robe. Elf, right. right? I mean, she's descended, directly descended from the, from Varda. No, not. Yes. No. <laughs> no, she's not. Just kidding. But she's she is immortal. Descended, she is descended from, um, uh, from, 
uh, Luthien, who is descended from... Um, oh, know, that's right. Um, yeah. Elion. That's right. Right. So yeah. Who was a Maya. She's got she's got Maiar blood in her. Right. And plus she's immortal. Mm-hmm. Just like the Queen of Heaven. True. So. No, I were. I mean, there's a lot of ways in which it works. Yeah. So yeah. I like it. Well, thanks. Your turn. All right. Awaiting doom stroke. Lady and Lord find new hope. The shadow departs. Ooh, I like it. Thanks. It's really good. Yeah. Obviously Farmir and the uh, AO in there, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Well done. We have no listener haiku today. Okay, very well. Because everybody's just, yeah. you know, it's been a busy time of year. It has. It has. Maybe with the new year, y'all can make resolutions to uh, send in more haiku. Yeah, I expect January will be a little more on the ball. Yeah. You know, December is just has just been a crazy month uh, yeah. for us. So yeah. lots right, of stuff but... going on even before Christmas. And uh, so, yeah. um, but I do expect to be pretty regular in January and February. Cap- so we'll see. We're almost done. We only have four chapters left That's now. Crazy! And then we get to do the movie review episode. Movie review episode. Yay. Well, and we're gonna do. We'll do a chapter. We'll, we'll do an episode on the appendices um, together. Oh, okay, okay. And um, and then we'll do, and then after yeah, the movie review episode, we'll do the Hobbit. We'll start to do the Hobbit. Awesome. Lots to look forward to. Indeed. Good stuff. Very much looking forward to it. Yeah. All me of- too. Lots of good to come in 2018. Looking forward to hearing, learning more about the Amazon show. Oh, yeah. Uh, as it further develops. Mm-hmm. Two Tolkien biopics. Um, one, you know, currently being filmed. One maybe currently being filmed. Um, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff going on. I will, by the way, and I know I've mentioned this, but I am very close to completing my second Tolkien book. Yay! And so I sh- I'm, my goal is to have uh, an announcement, an official announcement on that in January. So stay tuned for that, please. Uh, very excited to tell mm-hmm. you more about which particular Tolkien story I'm going to be looking at. So awesome! Very happy with how it's turning out. Yay! So. Yay! 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 All righty. All right, guys. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you to our patrons, uh, executive producers Dr. William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, James Applegate, Caitlin Fascista, Matt Scarrence, Al Taylor. Per Brenner, James Lindbergh, Chris Loftus, Lawrence McGowan, Richard Wall, and Spencer Foger. Thanks, you all. Rock. Yes, thank you guys so much. And thank the you best. to all our listeners. We will talk at you next time. Indeed, we will. Bye bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out TrueMyths.org and TolkienRoad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes and consider supporting us financially via patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 6, Chapter 6, Many Partings. Please send correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.